thanks, Michael. Thanks, Igor. Um, some 10 years ago, when uh, some of the people in the previous session were doing the thesis, I was appointed at MIT to be sort of the thesis prep coordinator, or what was you know, the thesis director. I was MIT's first MR thesis director, uh, which was an interesting new bureaucratic position. Um, and a, a colleague of mine who had taught thesis prep before that, he, he had a comment that has stuck in my head, um, is that my idea of hell is to be stuck in an island with previous thesis prep coordinators. <laughs> telling you what should be done about thesis. Um, so I think Nader, when he was at MIT, I think he was witness to that hell of mine, which is this perverse idea of inviting me to say something more about the topic. But um, <laughs> um, So some time ago, I spent some time with this sect that traverses the border between what is now India and Bangladesh. The sect emerged in the colonial era as a response to the particular entanglements of colonial political economy and religion, and its practices, practices borrow from a mixture of Vaishnav, Shakta, Islamic, Buddhist, and even Christian practices. The knowledge order cultivated within the sect tends towards the esoteric. One encounters a plethora of allegories and symbols coded for secrecy, an inner world of phenomenality which the novice must unpack in tutelage to and in tandem with her master or mistress, the guru. Each master may have no more than one disciple at a time. Knowledge is imparted, sought, and held within a dialogic premise. There's a refusal of knowledge superstructures such as that of the university. So many people have called this sort of a post-literate form of education, so literacy belonging to the mass educational enterprise, that's the university. This ongoing dialogue, which may last between pupil and master, which may last years, if not decades, presumes a certain reticence or silence on the part of the novice, a certain structuring of listening even as one asks or questions or interrogates the master. A little before his passing, Michel Foucault was beginning to turn towards this practice of silence um, as it transitioned from the Stoics to early Christian forms of reading and learning in what he titled as a na nascent project on quote unquote technologies of the self. And Foucault highlights um, 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 Plutarch's on listening to lectures as a standard bearer of his tradition. By the way, now there's beginning to look like him. <laughs> So first, we see the disappearance of dialogue and the increasing importance of a new pedagogical relationship, a new pedagogical game where the master teacher speaks and doesn't ask, uh, where the master teacher speaks and doesn't ask questions and a disciple doesn't answer but must listen and keep silent. A culture of silence becomes more and more important. In Pythagorean culture, disciples kept silent for five years as a pedagogical rule. Uh, they didn't ask questions or speak up during the lesson, but they developed the art of listening. This is the positive condition for acquiring truth. The art of listening is crucial so you can tell what is true and what is dissimulation, what is rhetorical truth and what is falsehood in the discourse of the rhetoricians. Listening is linked to the fact that you're not under the control of the masters, and this is important, you're not under the control of the masters, but you must listen to logos. You keep silent at the lecture, you think about it afterward. This is the art of listening to the voice of the master and the voice of reason in yourself. It is a sacrifice of the self, of the, of the subject's own will. This is the new technology of the self. So I put forward these thoughts as a kind of putting into parentheses the recovery of the thesis archive that the Cooper Union School has embarked on, an effort which at first pass, I must confess, brought a kind, sort of creepy, distressing feeling in my chest. If I were to use a more theoretical sounding term, and your previous dean wrote a book about it, you could say I was having an experience of the uncanny. So this creepy feeling, I must insist, emerged not out of the peculiarity and particularity of the Cooper archive, and it is on the other hand a very peculiar archive, but what they reveal about the peculiarity of the architecture discipline in general, or to be more specific, its pedagogy. So in studio, the desk crit 
retains a certain Socratic format, a teaching on a one-on-one -on -one basis. The entry in the program, into the program begins with an exercise in silence, a kind of meditation, an exercise in control. As a first step, the student is provided a simple object or exercise derived from a cultural memory of, of which she is as yet unaware, a diamond, a grid, a house, and so on. This the student must break down into a grammar of components whose elements must be manipulated to produce an object other than the one provided at the outset, but whose transformation must be demonstrated as proceeding according to a set of rules. The dialogic structure of master and disciple is set up precisely to establish what is and what is not rule-bound behavior of what does or does not count as a rule. As the student masters this rule-producing this rule behavior, the simple project produced, provided at the beginning is slowly opened up, exposed in a graduated way, to greater and greater degrees of noise, taking on further complexities of program, site, technological inputs, and so on. In each exercise, pedagogy hinges on the pupil's discovery of rules. And it is here, perhaps, that the autarchic nature of the Cooper Union archives opens up the, what I call the uncanny element in this graduated embrace of complexity. Complexity can only be embraced to the extent that the original lesson of simplicity or rulemaking is never lost. And so um, chess, and this is a sort of a chess project, is the classic um, uh, archetype of this, the, each move sort of encrusts every prior move and all future moves going forward. So the reversion to, or recursion to silence or the neutral becomes the primary rule. Thus beginning with the grid, one goes on to find grids everywhere. In construction systems and factories, the city becomes the example of a grid, as does Harlem and housing in Harlem, and grids in both dimensions, both vertical and horizontal. Walls, um, we could say prophylaxes, have to be constructed to staunch off the rigorously internalist nature of the exercise. What is a farm? What is a hospice? look the same. In some senses, it does not matter. Indeed, if we look through all of these drawings, there is almost a complete eradication of sight, at least as a drawn object. This is not coincidental. The grid itself is the sight, if not the program as well. If we ask, where does the grid come from, we are given some names. Mondrian, Gris, Picasso, Corbusier, but in truth, these are only markers of a much deeper esoteric cosmogony in which the modern represents only a kind of contingent recuperation of some primordial patterning of the world. I mean, there's no ambiguity, by the way, as to who ran this school. And if you look at Haida, on average, and 403 theses of the 533 sample size that were given, so that on average from 66 to 2000, he, had, he was on the committee of at least 11 students per year. I mean, that's, you know. Um, <clears throat> so the grid comes from the past, but this is a past that lives outside history in the secular sense. In that knowledge, in that sense, knowledge production within design pedagogy moves against enlightenment in the sense that it is explicitly posed against the premise that more knowledge of something explains anything. Knowledge is thus styled as the production and creep keeping of secrets, or what we could call the re reinvention of a handed down cosmogony. The origin does not have a past. At the same time, this cosmogonic fixation of the priority of a prior entails that design investigation must move forward only as the exposure of a certain archaeology. And I offered this as sort of... Uh, uh, a classic example of this dualist um, structure of backward and forward movement. Um, this is a project about two cities. There's a city on top and a city that is uh, buried, and then the project must actually cut through to reveal sort of the palimpsest between the two. Uh, so again, this kind of... Um, um, 
Okay, a for, um, as I said, a forward move also implies a backward move. Each design is explicitly constructed as a process of derivation from a prior state to a new state, thus revealing the presence of the old in the new. And in this project, for instance, uh, uh, this becomes literally a project of excavation. So excavation becomes the building. Um, in the Cooper thesis archives, there's a tremendous diversity. Oh, sorry, one, one other uh, comment I had on this. So this is what structures research in the context of thesis or research within studio, design as research or research as design. Um, research in this case does not produce facts, but it produces a series of micro epiphanies or realizations. And conversely, you can't just design something that's cool, quote unquote. You have to more demonstrate design as a determinate process that comes from a sort of rational set of decisions. Um, so in the Cooper thesis archive, there's a tremendous diversity of projects, and some of them really beautiful. But nonetheless, I would argue, without underrating that diversity, that this archaeological tendency consistently plays out into two distinct but related thesis types. I say consistent because we don't have to worry about too many extraneous influences in terms of knowledge paradigms. So there's no worrying about urbanism or technology or systems thinking. It's like Iceland, you know, no genetic contamination. <laughs> um, this pits Cooper as the polar opposite of MIT, perhaps, where any distraction is preferable as opposed to the need to focus on anything. Um, the first kind of project takes this or that original object, and this may vary. I mean, you get, you get a variety of different kinds of objects, and the one little you know, outside influence that comes in but has to do with the body, and I think in the 80s sort of feminism started to. So you can start from, uh, but it, in the end, the body is also dealt with in the same way. So, from, so you can start from diamonds, cubes, modernist paintings to dancers' bodies, but that is taken as a given. What is under scrutiny or examination is the forensics of the archaeological procedure itself. The path by which one goes from stage A to stage B to Z, each stage leaving an imprint or a cut on the object. We can cite various theoretical models here, from cinematic ideas about space-time transitions, which were quite popular at the time, to, of course, literal transparency, literal transparency, literal transparency. Um, and this is a project done, uh, so this is another example of a similar transitional project. Uh, um, mm. Seemed, okay, um, so this is an interesting example. This person styles, I mean, in his biographies that I found online later in his career, he says, I went to the A to, uh, to study under Peter Cook and I then came to Cooper to study under Haydock. Uh, so he produces a drawing machine, but the machine here, it's a, it, it sort of produces the record of, uh, of how the drawing comes to be. In, in, in other words, the, the machine is the construction line of the drawing. Um, Um, and this is another example where um, nature can be this sort of master figure of the past uh, and how you unpack it. Um, the second type of thesis um, takes the rule-bound procedure, on the other hand, as a given, and focuses instead on the metaphysics uh, underlying the originary figure or diagram as its target. One attempts to un unravel the a priori itself, or the zone of silence, to produce new cosmogonies new secrets from which architecture can draw strength, revisiting the place of the occult. I'm not saying that these two types are exclusive, um, that, um, but rather that there are projects that, or, or that there are projects that belong to one or the other, but that these two poles set up the two poles of a spectrum. So each project has some mix more or less of both. I started off with saying that in some way the Cooper archive made me think of this sect that crisscrossed the boundaries of Islam and Indic religion. And so I was perhaps confirmed or even pleased to see some confirmation of my intuition in this particular project, which takes up the Devnagari and Nastalik scripts, which is uh, which is mislabeled as Sanskrit and Persian scripts. Um, it, these are not scripts any, any more than English is the English script. Um, and then sort of does something with this stuff and brings the five square grid and the nine square grid 
some process of derivation, um, and I'm not quite sure what happens. I love the text here. If you look, spiral in two axes from implied center point to stated center point geometry of six and nine spiral from plane one to plane three um, as a thesis document. Um, but that's okay, it's a secret. Thank you. Hi, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, thank you, Igor and Michael, for the invitation. Um, and uh, thank you, Nader and Cooper Union, for having me. Um, ma many years ago, I actually had Diane Lewis as a professor, uh, accidentally or incidentally. Uh, and it's you know always a real honor to come back here. Um, and I consider this the mothership. So I think this is a very uh, important conversation uh, to be having regarding the status of thesis within the architectural education. Some schools have it, some schools don't. Amongst the schools that do, thesis is sometimes regarded as an important institution, uh, an event of, and at the magnitude of a grand opus that students look forward to uh, throughout their educational careers. Um, however, in some schools, the cur curriculum of thesis does not exist as they're completely eliminated altogether. Is one way better than the other? Are, they, are both answers valid? Let's discuss. So I began my journey of sifting through the archives of Cooper Union thesis files by looking for macro patterns spanning from 1966 to 2003, plus a handful of more recent projects in the 20-teens. Uh, the current archive contains uh, a super large number of projects that, you know, and so the research in itself was a bit daunting. Uh, and in addition to being daunting, it was a very intimate experience. It was as though I was granted access to peer into the hopes and dreams of so many people who were once young. Uh, so many people who, you know, wrote diaries of who, about who they wanted to be. I saw examples after examples of fully committed dedications towards uh, an educational season uh, that allowed the student to generate some, something that represented some notion of the self. And uh, I, I uh, swear, uh, Professor Duda and I had no communication. I'm also going to get into the technology of the self uh, in a bit. As I performed this work, I was also really struck by some other things. First, uh, something technical. Uh, the digital infrastructure that Cooper Union is developing has a work in progress organizational system, a system that identifies various typologies of, of categories of how thesis can be organized. Uh, each thesis project has its own page, and on this page, there are some basic information uh, that you need to navigate the context of the project. So for example, you know, super basic things, names of the author, names of the advisors, year, season, and the title of the project. Although this collection of information seems obvious, but knowing the basics does help tremendously. So for example, this one that you're looking at was in the late 80s, and clearly this person might have been concerned about the, the, the status of USSR at the time. So it's good to understand, you know, contextually, um, the late 60s, the early 80s, the late 80s, each had its own um, geopolitical implications, and it sometimes does come through. Uh, it sometimes comes through in the temperature of the project. What is also very interesting uh, is this, yeah, I also felt it was this, this one. So what was also really interesting uh, was this tab, metadata. Uh, here, I'm going to scroll down. You can see the metadata. Um, within it, the current system lists the following categories problem type, uh, program type, architectural element, and subjects. In particular, subjects uh, is also summarized uh, so that the thesis can be, you know, uh, understood as vocabularies. 
So as you click through the digital archive, you can start to see quantitatively uh, the general gravity of conversations, which conversations were being had, and which mentors had the heaviest hands. Because sometimes you can really read the iron <clears throat> because sometimes you can really read the Iron Fist of John Haydock, or Raymond, Raymond Abram, or Diane Lewis, and so forth. At times, I wonder if the students are really at the expense of the teachers, uh, worse, possibly at the expense of the quabbles amongst their, their teachers, uh, where scores supposedly could have been settled by the student's work. Uh, it reminds me of certain pedagogical model that resembles apprenticeship. If it is apprenticeship, why call it a thesis? But there are other times, I, th I think, you know, as I sift through the projects, uh, the will of the individuals seems to come through uh, as I begin to identify other traits, the, the, the display of the self, if you will. For me to continue this train of thought, I also have to turn to one of Michel Foucault's last projects, the technologies of the self. Obviously, it is impossible to do technologies of the self justice by summarizing it within such a short span of time, but I will attempt to communicate a super abridged synopsis from which a framework allowed me to regard the current status of thesis. To do good, uh, according to Foucault, to do good, there might be two possible ways. One <clears throat> is to forfeit the greatest good of the self in favor for the greatest good of the many, a type of betterment for the community at large. Perhaps this is why you see very many um, projects under the same title, Harlem Housing, uh, or a timely response to a late Reaganism uh, where, and other global catastrophes and so forth. Uh, it is possible also that Harlem Housing itself was another pedagogical iron fist. I wasn't there, we can only speculate. The second type of doing good, uh, according to uh, uh, technologies of the self, is to fully cultivate one's own self, a type of self that requires time and space to develop and, uh, and something that perhaps the rest of the community cannot understand and will not understand. And therefore, not only can one not, not forfeit one's own good for the greatest good of the many, one may even have to turn one's back on the community in order to cultivate such a notion of the self. To me, the, most of the House of series, the House of, House of Thesis projects are of this typology, uh, a type of, uh, I see them as self-portraits, using <clears throat> the house as a platform to perform endeavors that seem, are seemingly biographical, autobiographical, uh, transmitting something deeply personal. If we understand this dichotomy from a standpoint of the technology of the self, the dich dichotomy of doing good from the technology of the self, uh, from the standpoint of a Greco-Roman soldier's sacrifice versus a medieval Christian hermit's sa sacrifice, both are trying to do good, and both approaches uh, assume super drastic measures to achieve it. By the way, I also looked into a lot of the futures of these people. I think she's a director of urban planning now in Jersey, Jersey City. Uh, it's interesting that the self-portraits uh, do become a self-fulfilling prophecy later on. Um, the danger of either notions of the self, particularly the hermit self, is one that the individual might be led into an institutional, institutional thesis model uh, that may erroneously uh, convince someone that there is something to cultivate. And that the institutional uh, thesis model represents uh, the culture of education of architecture at large even, because thesis offers such an intoxicating platform towards the nurturing of self-indulgence. So powerful, uh, people doing thesis sometimes swim in, the, in their own pool of narcissism so deeply that charisma and performance alone might win the day, whether or not there is content, clarity, or production value. The infatuation of the self not only exists upon the platform that is thesis, in other areas of architectural education at large broadly also exists. In particular, if when we think about history and theory courses, architecture is a story often told uh, by the study of biographies. No wonder there are so many egomaniacs. Thesis encourages it. Okay, so I will step down from the ledge. Uh, and continue to evaluate thesis at large. 
over the years, I've seen very, very many thesis projects uh, at very many schools, including here at Cooper. Uh, I will outline a few common typologies. Some of them fall under, let's say, the community self, and some of them fall under the hermit self. First, uh, amazing context for research, uh, impossible to implement. So this is for the possibly would-be landscape ur urbanists or architectural journalists. Uh, they make really amazing, you know, detailed study of some map where maybe, maybe it's not even uh, site-specific, it's culturally, contextually specific, but it's a bunch of uh, studies about context, and it's not necessarily, uh, let's say, implementable. Second, contemporary catastrophe with good intentions uh, to ameliorate issues, uh, but with possibly Jesuit outcomes. With every tsunami, every warfare, every unqualified president, uh, someone will always try to do some good. Uh, and doing good is very hard. Doing good gracefully without seeming like a hypocrite is even harder. Third, new technology or materiality. Um, by learning to you know, uh, master or hone the technologies of the time, uh, maybe there's a thesis in there. But I also sometimes wonder, learning to build amazing musical instruments, uh, like violins or, or so, uh, does not necessarily train a musical composer. So and I'm also not talking about the actual instrument thesis, uh, which is very common at, at the Cooper archives. Uh, I'm, I'm more talking about, you know, let's say if AR, VR is really hot right now, or uh, the tessellation algorithm of yesterday's were, you know, important. Uh, I would say um, this happens less so at Cooper, but it happens a lot in other schools. Fourth, personal stories. Uh, this is particularly abundant here at Cooper Union. And I would say uh, when students don't have a personal story, uh, they may turn to divinity or other canons like Greek mythology, biblical stories like Noah's Ark or Babel or, or Shakespeare. And this is really difficult to engage with, I have to say. And maybe this is the uncanny part uh, that Professor Duda was talking about. And, you know, of the schools with thesis programs that feels like institutions like GSD, Princeton, or SciArc, uh, there are also other patterns that I would, I would say are patterns of notions of success. Um, whether uh, the emphasis is on theatricality, visual essays, or simply excellence in production value, which is really common in SciArc, uh, sometimes thesis itself is independent from the construction of one's own identity uh, or a stage upon which a grand opening warrants the assurance of a self to emerge. As I mentioned, by doing this research, I was able to read into the diaries of so many people who were once young, and the tough part was really the where are they now mid-credit scene of the Cooper Union Breakfast Club. Uh, I'm not sure if thesis helps or hurts. Uh, by instituting thesis and suggesting a celebrated biography is a high risk where students lead themselves. They may lead themselves astray because not everyone can lead themselves. I want to conclude though on a higher note. Uh, don't get me wrong, uh, I'm actually pro-thesis. <laughs> and not all thesis projects are bad. In fact, uh, there are incredible, incredible moments in the history of architectural thesis that continue to suggest to me that there is something worth fighting for. Um, there are thesis projects out there that remind us to make declarations, participate in the ongoing history of cultural production, practice with practice the nuanced socio-political critique uh, through a cool medium that is architecture, and uh, commence the first chapters of hopefully a long and joyful journey uh, of architectural practice. But I think, you know, since I'm invited here uh, at this table to discuss pedagogical concerns, I'm laying my cards on the table for further discussions. If thesis is a fork in the road from which the technologies of the self is generated, how we manage such an awareness of the self uh, will possibly prevent a trip down the pool of narcissism. Thank you. Hello. 
I'm here today to speak about the Erwin S. Channing School of Architecture Archive, which was established in 1983, uh, shown here. Uh, housed within the School of Architecture on the second floor, so that thing over there. Uh, but the archive I want to talk about today is not the one over there, but the one that is accessible here through this laptop, the digital archive that looks something like this. Um, I have a much more lo-fi version of scrolling through everything than Jimenez. It's just scrolling with screenshots. Um, <laughs> this is the first time I only, I kind of stopped after four. Um, but. As aspects of the archive have started to become digitized, up to 522 projects to date can be viewed through a web interface with access to student thesis projects dating back to close to 70 years. So if you scroll a little bit and uh, download, like it, I took a lot of screenshots, uh, it looks something like this. So the object of this digital archive can kind of be measured something like this. And so this is some version of, you know, the material we're looking at here today, uh, which is, I think, is fascinating. I, all the speakers so far have tried to find a way to do some sort of pattern recognition across the sheer depth of it. And so it's an utterly spectacular and overwhelming demonstration of architectural design production. Um, in the short time I've had to look at the archive, which what has interested me most is what the archive reveals about the institution that houses it and what this tells us about the making of archives generally that they are, in a sense, an institution-making process, and I would say in this specific case, a means for the institution to produce uh, its particular type of discursive authority. And so to this end, the material that immediately struck me as most revealing within the archive are the various forms of documents uh, surrounding thesis, not the actual projects themselves, but the chatter around the projects. Uh, the project abstracts, abstracts arguing for student designs, the course briefs and syllabi written by faculty and advisors, the correspondence between faculty faculty and the administration to students, and perhaps the most fascinating of all the written transcripts, um, of all the written documents in the archive is the transcripts of final uh, review presentations. This is the transcription of Tillman Wagner's final review from 1992 for his thesis titled The Space of the Mind. It isn't the final, final transcription. This is the draft that was sent to Tillman to provide revisions and markups. Here on this page, you can see an extreme level of care to the process of documentation, codified with a legend of symbols explaining missing or inaudible texts from the audio tapes that are the source of the transcriptions and other ways to note the validity of the document. And so from what I've learned, you know, looking at the digital archive, which is the primary uh, archive I've looked at today, these transcripts are more from around the late 80s to um, the 90s. Um, so somewhere within this fastidious, precise process, one that invites students to review, revise, and edit the object that will serve as the authority of documentation of the final thesis event, uh, we can see here tags that correlate, you know, these yellow tags up here, uh, correlate exactly to uh, chunks of text within the drawings and models or other materials that form the final presentation. So we're starting to put the presentation in relation to the other objects in the archive. Um, these transcripts are actually mind-boggling. Um, and I'm only just starting to get familiar with the material and we should definitely look at them more and there's probably four different ways we could talk about them. Um, but within them we can start to see something about the performance that is the final review. Uh, we can take the temperature of discourse within uh, this section of the field within this particular period of time and we can also do something we don't normally get to do. Uh, we can totally decontextualize a comment from a review and put it in dialogue with an image from the final review project. And so what I thought I would do today as a way to engage the enormity of this archive, which is vast and demands further scrutiny, is to give you a few quick snippets of overhead chatter from the archive. Uh, number one, comments. This is an extract of the transcript from Jason Volland's 1993 final review for his thesis titled Angel Space, A Potter's House. Gersten. I think you can't help but feel that this piece sitting here speaks to the other worlds, whether it's Stein, Correction, Steinish, Charles, Four Worlds, or any other worlds. And you know, the word revolution, it's funny, because Copernicus wrote a book called The Revolutions of the Planets, I mean the cosmos. And then because of the impact it had on astronomy, it picked up the meaning, this is the project we're talking about here, uh, it picked up the meaning new. Revolution started to become new. Revolutionary was something new, because he said the revolution of the planets, and then that book went into astronomy the way it did. And so they started calling that effect revolution, which you know when they are turning, we sit here and they swirl and they turn, and you know what's going up. You can't help but feel it's a revolution. Scully, it's a comet. Uh, 
<laughs> Gersten. Yeah, it's a comet. It's a will revolution. Someone unknown. That's moving. <laughs> Dreams. An extract from Amy Finkel's 1992 thesis, A Window into History. Hayduck. Sorry. Metz. We dream in black and white. Hayduck. Or dreams. You know, what about dreams? Is that you can never know. How can I say it? You can never know. You can capture the images of dreams. This is the project we're talking about. Fragments of dreams, but you can never recapture the sound of dreams. And that is another issue entirely. We, were, we never are able to describe the sound of our dreams. We can describe the images, the clips, or whatever they happen to be, but... <laughs> stop. She brings up a whole, a whole aspect of Europe and America and what is happening in Europe today. You see, I believe it's going, getting slick, rapidly slick, where it was less to some time ago. Stop. And the stranger part of it is, two years after the wall came down, right, it's still a peculiar sensation of going because they don't let go. In other words, it's wonderful that it's not like gone yet. The Eastern Germany, it's going to go fast, but still, it's at a moment. Stop. Tell everybody, get over now. Go see Potsdam before it goes. Go see Prague before it goes. It goes so fast that you can't believe it. Where castles become boutiques, something else scrubbed out. A palace becomes a cafe and it's all that. And at the same time, America. We're so uptight money-wise. We have no money. So all of a sudden, something else is creeping in, which I believe to be good, that you couldn't sit through. I don't believe it is an accident that we sat through two, three days here, and the issue that this generation is confronting is quite different than what I was probably in school, and certainly, Don, when you were in school. So it's a different condition. But this didn't explain anything. Moving on. <laughs> Sick fish. Uh, this is chatter from Damon Shank's 1994 thesis, House for Three Musicians. Hey, duck. I tell you, every time I came into the classroom, I ran over to your table like a lot of tables. But his table in particular, because it was absolutely every time there was a sense of true discovery going on. And I'm not talking about creative talent, which is, you know, has a sense of being. And I mean to have it in your blood, to know, to be, you know, to be able to do things. But there was an intellect. I mean, that's the thing. I came away with all the time that there was an intellect and it was not separated from the body, from the sense, a certainty of soul and for the thought. And it was, and the fish was really, I mean, the fish, I mean, was very special in a sense because he loved that particular life of the fish. And it was always amazing to all of us that it lived as long as it did. But I think it lived as long as it did in a certain way because you willed it so right. Damon, the medicine helped too. <laughs> Hadek. And the yeah. And that was the other thing. I forgot about that, but it's the first time I recognized there was such a thing as a sick fish. I never knew that in all my life, almost 65 years of dot, 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 and never realized that a fish can be sick. <laughs> but not sick like, you know, like being thrown up in the seashore, but sick. And this guy comes along and makes it well again for a while by feeding it antibiotics. 3 October 1989. From John Haydock, Dean, the Irwin S. Cheney School of Architecture of the Cooper Union, subject, October schedule. Advanced concerts with Professor Eisenman, schedule as discussed. Seminars with the visiting professor, Remo Gidiri, Wednesdays and Thursdays, 10 a.m. to 12 noon, is rooms 312, October 4th, 5th, 11th, 12th, 18th, 19th, 25th, 26th. Reviews for Professor Haydock Knox Vila section Tuesday 3rd of October 2 to 5 p.m. Wednesday 4th of October 2:30 to 5 p.m. Thursday 5th of October 2 to 5 p.m. Films for the entire thesis classes. Morning becomes Electra Wednesday. Symphony Pastoral Wednesday. Donald Trump. Oh, this one's kind of got away from me. Let me just shrink that. We'll read it here. Everything we're talking about frugality and the idea, I'm beginning to like New York again because really it was, I think like it was 10 to 15 years because it's not frugality, Mets, Donald Trump's. All that, the whole shebang, and now it's getting to be more austere, more frugal, and consequently feels more authentic. I won't get into the, all the sociological, economical subtleties of the thing. Jeopardy. You know, 
when he started out, I realized that for the past few years, there's been a sort of like Xerox technique that has been going on. I mean, he uses this condition, and there's no, you know, he uses this Xerox machine for what it's made for, essentially. You know, there's no tape problems. Hey, Duck. Using Xerox and graphite all over the place. Dot, dot, dot. Vila. Well, it's like the Jeopardy game. It's Jeopardy USA. They give you the answer, and then you have to come up with the question, and that's the predictability. Hey, Duck. Jeopardy USA? April 26, 1982. Dear Dean Haydock, the thesis class held a meeting on Thursday, April 22, to discuss the probability of a one-week extension of our final review from May 4, 5, and 6 to May 11, 12, and 13. Several of us feel such an extension is necessary to meet our own production requirements for the review. This being due to conflicting um, exam and presentation schedules from other classes. Many would simply like to have a little more time to prepare a cohesive, informative presentation. We therefore would appreciate your consideration in granting us such an extension. Thank you. Sincerely, signed below. The House. Um, and so this is the first uh, syllabus, this is the first document in the archive that's a kind of a syllabus from one of the thesis courses. So it's from 1978 and it's Massimo Scolari's uh, document. The House. The house must not have long, low windows. It must not be on Pilates. It must not have a flat roof. It must not refer itself to tradition. And so I'm going to scroll through some of the projects from that year. It must not refer itself to, to the tradition of the modern movement. It must not be only a dwelling. It must not be higher than two floors above ground. It must not rest directly on the ground. It must therefore have a base. It must not be symmetrical in respect to its principal axes. At least one side must have a projection or a recession. Uh, this is uh, Liz Diller's project with John Haydock that wasn't in Massimo's class, but maybe they're talking to each other. Who knows? And so I'm going to end with something abstract, which is looking at the abstracts, uh, but it ends a little bit abstracts. And so to conclude and to offer maybe another technique to engage the chatter of the archive, um, I was fortunate enough to originally try to scrape all the data from the digital archive, and then I thought maybe I could just email Stephen and he'd give it to me. Um, and so Stephen did give it to me, which wasn't as fun as writing a bot. Um, but you know, he, when I had this metadata, and it's kind of vast, it get, and given my pension for understanding the thesis project through the institutional dialogue surrounding it, I was quickly drawn to all of the currently available project abstracts, uh, this column here. Um, after passing and scrubbing the data, I created a large array of project texts, which I then fed into the most advanced natural language processing machine learning algorithms, and attempted to produce my own abstract from this textual corpus. Uh, so after producing hundreds of permutational abstracts, uh, I came up with this one, something to do with Central Park. I came up with something to do with Vikings. Uh, I came up with something to do with this one of my thesis is the wow that we that were to die this instant. How long would be confined by, col by columns or corners? The instruments may be played in any combined. Duh. Um, and so I think the final absolute abstract extracted from this archive temple. It is constructed as the subway station, the edges. In my diamond painter industry thesis is an air inflated structural commercial. Residential units form a structure. Flexible systems permit apartments, workshops, shadow theaters, jester, arc. Thank you. Okay, well that's a tough act to follow. Um, but thank you so much to Michael and Igor, to the Dean Tirani and Cooper Union. Um, it's been such a pleasure and a privilege to look through these archives. Okay. So I took this prompt of research um, as an opportunity to think about how a school defines research through thesis and how that is so historically and institutionally specific. Scrolling through the archives, as we've all done, um, the archive of thesis projects at Cooper Union is to move through a sequence of ideologies at this school. It becomes clear how much the definition of research has changed over time and also how different the research done here was from any other institution. 
I'm also going to talk about meta patterns that I noticed across the projects. Um, I'm going to do it moving chronologically because I actually found that to be um, an interesting sort of transition point in the work would be the ends of decades. Um, but before I do that, since I believe we all come with our own bias situated knowledge, um, I think it's important to show my cards and describe the kind of research me methodology that shaped me. So I did my MRC thesis at Princeton um, around the same time as Andrew Kovacs and completed thesis under Liz Diller studying with faculty such as Sarah Whiting, Stan Allen, Sylvia Levin, and Lucia L.A. At the time, the school was definitely in a projective moment um, as defined by Sarah Whiting and Bob Somal. So there was an emphasis on moving architecture outside of academia and finding agency in the outside world. So what that meant for research was that research was a combination of dis disciplinary knowledge, um, the history and theory of architecture, formal analysis, technical knowledge, as well as extra disciplinary knowledge um, from other fields, the social sciences, political theory, and histories of technology. In thesis, students were encouraged to position themselves not only within the field of architecture, but also in relation to allied disciplines, such as landscape, planning, social practice, etc., and to do research by studying architectural history and also doing field work inspired by the social sciences and sciences. I say inspired by it because it um, was often sort of pseudo-scientific. I still believe in this orientation towards agency, um, but it's interesting how those discussions often excluded discussions of form, composition, and imagination that were so central to thesis here at Cooper Union. Um, one could see this as a larger contrast in our field between the kind of research that is recognized by other academic fields and the kind that is very specific to the discipline of architecture, what we call design research. And I think this is playing out in interesting ways right now in terms of debates about PhDs in architecture architecture versus PhDs by design. So I think it's an important moment for us to reflect on what it is that is architectural research um, for both forming thesis but also thinking about pedagogy and architecture uh, more generally. So this, um, to get into the specifics, I'll take you through some of these projects by decade, pointing out both what is present but also what is absent. And echoing some of the other presentations, I think a key theme here is really the relationship of the self um, to both the field and issues outside of architecture. So the very strong influence of John Haydick um, is visible here and more generally the New York Five. Um, with, in the 1960s, projects focusing on houses rendered in black and white on empty ground, often in oblique drawings, sometimes derived from the nine square grid or inspired by modernist artworks. There's no representation of context, very little information about materiality or program. The research here is about um, the manipulation of formal systems, representation, and the relationship between visual art and architecture. This is very much an iterative approach, as Professor Duta was describing. And John Haydeck is often the sole advisor. In the 1970s, there is an expansion in scale, which mirrors interests in urbanism, infrastructure, and landscape in the discipline at large. So we see projects for housing, a public library, a steel plant, canal, and aqueduct. The team of advisors expands with Raymond Abraham appearing alongside John Haydeck, Peter Millard, and Lewis Davis. In terms of research, there is an engagement with complex systems of infrastructure and planning, but also an extreme abstraction of information given the complexity of these systems. Form and representation form and representation continue to be paramount. There seem to be few signs of emergent environmental movements and countercultural movements, which elsewhere were spawning experiments in renewable energy systems, sustainable building, and collective living. In the 1980s, we see a wider range of scales, media, and references. There's increasing importance of narrative and the continuing importance of the house. Designs are intended for specific inhabitants, sometimes real, sometimes fantastical. Um, in this decade, the poetic and the phenomenological are particularly dominant. Research seems to be an individual, intuitive process. Um, some interesting contrasts are the projects around the musical instruments. I think some of these are actually exercises that were not thesis, but were labeled as thesis. There's some ambiguity about that um, in the archive. Um, but the musical instrument process was focusing on tools, on technologies, on some systems of projection, also multiple projects on housing in Harlem that seem to be more focused on optimizing that technology, but also insist on a level of formal abstraction. 
it's quite incredible that we don't see any traces of the postmodernism that was flourishing elsewhere at the same time. So the pastel color palettes, neoclassical forms, dislocated facades, this is a very different strain of postmodernism. Instead, we can see it as really kind of continuing um, legacies of phenomenology and looking towards um, internal narratives, personal narratives, as Jimenez was talking about. Um, in the 1990s, there's continuing emphasis on narrative and on the house, but also a surge in model making, experiments with the body, with sequence, time, and movement. Tools and instruments of measurement and projection are increasingly important. Um, so here the body, uh, interest in the body parallels emerging discourses around feminism, around sexuality, relationships between the body and the space, but those remain um, primarily personal reflections. They're not so much talking about issues around domestic typology movements of body, systems of control. There are exquisite inter interesting drawings um, that shape complex, that trace complex systems of movement. And I think actually these drawings, um, like the, the drawing machine that was shown earlier, they mark an important shift in the conception about the self in design. Because where previously much of the design research emerged from the self, here we see a greater interest in observation and documentation in how design is mediated by technologies of representation and the gap between the self, the drawing, and the outside world. There's an assumption here that design comes from a feedback loop between observation, projection, and imagination. The influence of Robin Evans' drawing, uh, writings on translations from drawing to building are very clear here. In the 2000s, there's a sudden leap into social engagement. Um, there are projects about political crises, but with a continuity of the poetic approaches of Raymond Abraham and Levius Woods, um, strong echoes of phenomenology. And in these projects, we can see it's interesting that in approaching very real political crises and doing documentary research about sites, um, students are nonetheless turning towards what they see as universal elements, such as ground, sky, or hearth, as the resolution to these conflicts. So there's an appeal to a kind of essentializing universal idea about architecture and space. The research um, is looking at architectural history in terms of timeless forms. So there's a big contrast, I would say, in this project from 2013, um, from Eze Imade Aribo. Um, that this is actually a project that requires extensive research into existing conditions, both material and social, not looking for timeless or universal forms, but instead focusing on banality. Um, she's proposing highly specific strategic design interventions and methods of social practice that are multiscalar, connected with materiality. So this is a very different research me methodology that's very much about a kind of um, a field work, an observation that's interdisciplinary as well, um, and looking towards social practice and community engagement. So I think it's interesting to see how in this span of time, Cooper has very much started to orient towards other definitions of research, particularly in the last 10 years, which we heard a little bit about um, previously in the panel about that intentional shift. Um, and this is more similar to the kind of research projects that are visible in some of the other schools that have been mentioned, so Princeton, the GSD. Um, but I think that Cooper is sort of at an interesting juncture here, where they have the legacy of cultivating a kind of design research based on the poet architect. Um, the advantage of that is extensive vocabulary in talking about form, imagination, composition, drawing, um, which can sometimes be excluded from these other conversations. And it's one of the few places that cultivates a kind of wild experimentation in model making, in um, these technological um, sort of machines for drawing, um, for expressing the self as well. Um, but it's interesting to see how now in research there's, there's an intention to intersect that with transdisciplinary research, social justice, and environmental science. These are discourses that traditionally do not mix, um, sometimes very intentionally so in a kind of reaction against phenomenology and critical theory, um, but in part because the architect has a very different type of selfhood or subjecthood in relationship to the outside world in these different discourses. These have been binaries of disciplinary versus interdisciplinary, abstract versus specific, subjective versus objective, or pseudo-objective if we're being realistic. Um, but it seems like an enormous opportunity for the school to ask how it can pit these frameworks against each other or in dialogue with each other to develop more complex designer subjects. Thank you.
Well, uh, good day, everybody, and uh, I want to thank everybody for all of the thank yous. One of the <laughs> curious honors of of being at the dean here is uh, getting so much credit and blame for those things we don't actually do. So <laughs> let me start first by thanking uh, certainly Igor, uh, Michael, uh, uh, Stephen Hillier uh, and the archives, uh, the guests, uh, and, and really behind all of this a history of faculty and students within the thesis program that uh, makes such an event uh, possible in the first place. Uh, it is really an, an intense uh, experience being uh, in the gallery space and so I, I welcome you after this to go there but also certainly to see that work through the eyes of, uh, uh, of both critics and uh, those allied with the work. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to mention this has been a an incredibly intense week for ourselves also. Not all of you have been here for these uh, events, but we started out the week with uh, 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 Fabio Gramazio and Mijin Yoon uh, talking about technology uh, in, the, in the Great Hall, followed by uh, Cecil Balmond, um, who gave the uh, uh, another uh, talk about technologies and uh, uh, the role of his research, uh, followed by Hashem Sarkis uh, on this very stage last night, uh, and he may come back into this discussion in some form or another. Uh, today's uh, events are what they are, and followed by uh, this coming Tuesday, uh, I encourage you all to come back again uh, in a celebration of Harry Cobb's uh, new book, uh, and he will be surrounded by none other than uh, Marion Weiss, uh, Elizabeth Diller, Joseph Connors, and President Scott Cohen uh, to talk about uh, the challenges of the architectural predicament, both in service um, of society on the one hand, but also with the inevitability of failure if it does not serve itself within the discipline. And that's certainly something that has uh, come up today in the narcissism that we so await to discuss. Um, so if only to get the conversation started, maybe I can uh, go back to the, the question of research itself. Uh, you ended by articulating certain differences in research, and certainly Arindam in referring to uh, MIT as the, the opposite of Cooper, uh, you insinuated that uh, there are uh, completely different measures of what constitute research. Uh, and, and if it's going to be a productive discussion, to some degree we have to establish how do we build research to begin with in other fields, uh, to uh, give value or give measure or, or understand what is it that we do uh, and what do we do that others cannot do. Well, I think it's always been an identity crisis in architecture of also institutionally, how do you justify the work that we do for tenure, et cetera, um, relative to other departments? Do you make it look like the kind of scholarly work that's done in other fields or claim a kind of independence and separate separation? Um, in my view, it's, it's inherently a combination of the sort of inside and outside that's come up a lot today. It's arguing for a relationship between a disciplinary knowledge of form, of tectonics, of, of you know, disciplinary history, and the kind of urgency of exterior um, conditions, and maybe even arguing that that's, there is no inside and outside, but it's all one connected kind of web. Um, I think it's really sad that in our field there's often such a divide between discourses that are interior and exterior, um, even by institutions. I've sort of taught on both coasts and noticed dramatic contrasts in um, whether we're focusing on design research or on scholarly research that 
could be recognized um, by other departments. So I think there's a part of what I was hoping to stage was the need for those things to talk to each other. And how can they talk to each other? Well, I think you teach them together. Um, I mean, one of the things I think is so important in teaching is to show students how tools of representation um, and formal organizational systems are culturally specific, that they don't exist in a vacuum. So every time you teach them something, um, as much as possible, given the level of, um, you know, the phase of education, you convey that this is one way of doing things among a range, and to understand the consequences for those choices in terms of what is shown and what is left out. Arindam, I cannot imagine a, a, a more different environment in which to operate. And, and I've uh, gained the pleasure of, of being in MIT also, where I found myself as lost as anywhere else I've, I felt. So maybe you can characterize both the disciplinary and institutional frameworks that uh, bring uh, the varying modalities of research into conflict with each other and how that plays itself out. Yeah. Uh I mean, so you brought up uh, tenure, actually. I didn't expect to hear that. But you're absolutely right how it operates at the highest level, but also it cultivates uh, a, a, a sense of self as you go up through the ranks in order to get tenure. So. Yeah, I, I address it in two senses. Uh, one is from the institutional disciplinary level of, I mean, in that sense, who do you hire? I mean, and who teaches design versus who teaches research or some mix of the other and who is to make the determinations as to it. And the other aspect of this is how is the student going to negotiate any of that, right? I mean, that, so this, um, and I might make you cringe, Nader, but I'll, I'll I, you know, so Nader came into MIT and MIT famously is this completely siloized place where design for a long time was supposed to be the center, but it, it's in many ways, it was continually weakened. And the, the nature of how tenure operated within a technological institute meant that people in, you know, were sort of somewhat associated with design, but were doing other kinds of things related to design, were getting tenure at the higher success rates. Uh, um, so we have, I was talking to Deborah Burke at Yale, and you know, they have, what, six tenured faculty in all of Yale, uh, SOA. Um, and we have eight historians at MIT, right? I mean, so just that. We have a BT <coughs> faculty. So uh, precisely the idea was in the 70s to have research drive design. But what happened was these silos started to operate. I'm not, say, I'm not saying this is good or bad. I'm just sort of offering a historical account here. And so there's the building technology, there's computation, there's, there's history theory, there's, you know, and each of them have like five or six, right? And then the designers are in the middle and they quite don't know what to do with themselves. And then, you know, it's a kind of strange. Uh, um, and uh, when Nader became head, I mean, he, uh, we sort of concocted this new, that this program which is supposed to be like a design research program called SMARTS, which is a sort of not a, a non-professional, it's a, it's a non-professional master. That, and Nader and I sort of concocted this new discipline within SMARTS because SMARTS, there's a SMARTS in history, the SMARTS in BT, the SMART, but no SMARTS in design, right? So we're like, okay, maybe, you know, like, and none of these people were talking to each other anyway. The building doesn't allow anybody to talk to anybody. It's like you're know, scattered in some giant, you know, you know um, la labyrinth of building. And, and we were like, what will this architectural design masters look like? Right, if you remember that. And another sort of started to list, you know what the designers need is like, they need inputs on building technology, they need inputs on history, they need inputs on computation. <laughs> and I was like, wait, you're just replicating what is already here, which we're trying to change. <laughs> so, so there is a kind of, my point being that there's a kind of, impo it, it, and it's not just that, it's even, it's not like the historians or the <coughs> computation people or, there is no consistency in terms of what constitutes the criteria for research, even within these sort of siloized micro disciplines. So no wonder that when the design student is trying to navigate all of that, it's really like a papuri of choices that they are trying to make some sense of. Now, 
from the standpoint of thesis, which I all taught, and I have a little bit of sympathy for the narcissism because, like, what else can you do, right? I mean, it's kind of, uh, in, in the end, it's the best and perhaps the only sort of frail defensive gesture that one can make. It's like, at least say, I am I, you know. So, so the students come and they, they want to, I mean, they've been brought to this rigorous, pedagogical pattern of it. every exercise is so controlled, the teacher is always telling them not to do certain things. And they're finally, so they've been asked to be silent for three years. And then third year, now suddenly, you're, oh, go ahead and speak. And they just, I mean, you know, so at that point, you grab the world. They're like, I'm interested in carbon trading, blah, 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 blah. You lack the tools to talk that language. And in any case, it's not your disciplinary language. The discipline lacks the means. You want to bridge between what you know and what you want to know. So there is this chaos that happens. Uh, and after, in, in, at, at MIT, thesis is a one-year process. You do thesis prep and then thesis. And for 11 months of this, it's like this floundering around, right? And it, inevitably, it comes to the penultimate thesis review where at that point, the student is certifiably freaking out, <laughs> right? And the faculty who are advising them also freaking out. At which point, there's always, a, if, if we're lucky, actually, there's this twist back to the previous three years of education. At the end of it, like, wrap it up, the baby is washed off, you know, and at the end, the thesis discussion is about, okay, what have you learned? But it, so in, in other words, we don't learn anything about the environment. We don't learn anything in the thesis discussion. That is not what is in play. Um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to the impossibility of the enterprise. I mean, it might sound like I'm making fun of the process, but I think there's a, I think on some level, sort of corralling knowledge paradigms within architecture is a very special kind of instance of corralling knowledge paradigms anyway. And that's how we should look for it. I don't know how to teach somebody research. I just, I just don't. I mean, I, I research, I, I consider myself a researcher, but I don't know how to teach it. So l last night, um, uh, I, I don't know at which point it came up, but Hashim, in response to a question, tried to characterize the, the, the problem of the, the architect's identity in face of the question of what constitutes research. Uh, and he said that, I, I'm sure I'm going to mischaracterize what he said, but here's the gist, but that uh, in the sciences, there are presumed uh, challenging problems out there in the world, and uh, a, a methodology has to be brought forth. Uh, and so therefore, you, you study the what and the how through certain iterations, producing evidence through which you can make a, an assessment. And uh, he underlined, to some degree, the, the futility of that, because it, of its inability to uh, pose a different question. Uh, and he underlined the idea that somehow the questions sometimes need to come from not, fr from not within, but from the externality to the equation itself. Uh, and, and how architects don't do what, but they say what if. And so that the act of projection is a central part of uh, the research, which in many ways you can't prove or, or you can't justify, but it, it, it relies uh, on a different uh, component of faith or s some other uh, aspect of what we do. That, that architecture is between this and that, uh, and, and without that we are nothing. No, I think, sorry, I'm just kind of uh, nodding in agreement and thinking about the notion of what if. Uh, earlier in Brian's presentation, he was talking about possible worlds. And I think, um, let's say, if, if we examine, if, if um, utopian projects uh, throughout the history of architecture are some indications of what thesis might be, um, I, I feel like, I think almost every utopian project I can think of is somewhat of a reflection on the world they live in, uh, but just dialed up in uh, extreme hyperbole. 
uh, and so the what if um, possible world of a world uh, with so for example if uh, consumerism and capitalism and modernism were to take over the entire world and and that there's a, only one type of monument that will crawl crawl over every space uh, over every landscape uh, that is a type of hyper, hyperbole you know uh, I guess late late 60s young Italians were dealing with and they were asking themselves uh, why are we being educated if we cannot build buildings as Italians uh, if, we're, if we're here to just make preservations we're not really architects and I think uh, that is a response uh, only can be answered with something like a what if you know what if we just dialed this up uh, really high so to, to bring it full circle back to to your presentation I'm gonna play John McLaughlin for a second here on a scale of 1 to 10 1 being the lowest 10 being the highest uh, how narcissistic is the utopian project Pro probably nine nine and a half nine and ten <laughs> Probably high, very high, probably high. <laughs> but so, so you are arguing for the indis indispensability of narcissism as the, the, the major conduit through which we may be able to unravel the possibility of uh, architectural research then. It's, it's, yeah, it's almost unavoidable to, <laughs> I mean, but then I think I, I wanted to use the word harnessing. Like if when, it, you know, you know um, there are, what can architects do that our other disciplines cannot do? I think the, the projection of worlds is something that architects can do. Um, and it does require a certain sense of uh, conviction uh, of the self. And sometimes that comes off as narcissism, maybe. But if you think about narcissism, um, like as was described before, as a sort of uh, fallback when you're faced with this crisis of, of being overwhelmed with options and not knowing what to do. Um, I think part of the issue is that schools don't really um, help students navigate the fact that there are these range of definitions of research, because a lot of schools are sort of just trying to kind of get their own ideology to keep sustaining itself, and that degree of relativism is not really useful um, to that. So I feel like it would be really helpful for students to just see something like this, you know, to have an exposure to the range of either the archive of their institution or of types of studio project or thesis projects that are done in other schools and a discussion about the fact that there are more than one, there's more than one way to do research and it has different value systems about the self and the world. You know, if exposed to that, I feel like the choice about how you go into that process would be a lot more conscious and less kind of, oh my God, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm, I'm not entirely, I mean, if you take the sciences as an example, no scientist actually learns the meta structure of what is research methodology before they dive into a problem. In fact, they, I mean, the apprentice model is slightly different in the labs because you're actually an employee. It's like sort of half, um, I mean, I, I think it, 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 to a certain extent, perhaps if one can be of some use in that process is to sort of ask the student to examine counterfactuals when utopias are being proposed. So for example, let's take a normal project, you know, this is a very common project, collective housing, right, like mass housing, something like that. Has this, does the student have any sense of land values, bylaws, uh, mortgage rates, etc.? I mean, why am I saying this? Go read Frank Lloyd Wright's Broadacre City, City, which is sort of a classic utopian text, if anything. He spends most of his time figuring out salaries, mortgages, he even designs a new currency for this city. I mean, and he provides the calculation of how this currency will be amortized over such and such period. And, you know, and it's completely bizarre and doesn't make any economic sense, but <laughs> it is a truly alternative universe. And you could argue that perhaps the Milton Friedmans of the world, when they write economic theory, were also creating completely alternative universes, but somehow they can't. And so you, you know, that utopia became our current Donald Trump reality, but for what it's worth, those are also active utopias. But so I, I feel like, I mean, it, it would be, I think it's it, perhaps if we, utopia is necessary in architecture, but to what degree does that have a kind of realist content, and by realism, I really mean realism and not reality. You know, like, how do you make this thing a 
approximate a kind of world that is plausible or believable, even in, if it's some alternative world. I mean, that's that's the kind of, I mean, fiction is neither false nor truth, right? I mean, it's, it's, that's the kind of fiction, and what is the rigor of the fiction? You know, that, I mean, I think that's perhaps what one can best hope for. Uh, Farzine, how does the transcription sound so far? <laughs> Good. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. Uh, invariably, as we as we speak, uh, and we're transcribed, we're we're all horrified by what we say. Uh, and many years later, students come back and tell me what I told them, uh, and I'm horrified yet again. Uh, you helped us uh, to come to grips with that and to be fearful of sitting here and <laughs> saying hardly anything. Uh, but, but you also expose the vulnerability of the pedagogical process because there is no uh, script per se uh, and many things are said out of context also. Uh, strangely so, you picked up some transcriptions that were historical in nature but I'd actually heard on reviews in the last two or three years. So we also repeat ourselves to some degree. <laughs> Comments. <laughs> uh, um, but uh, it also reminded me of something that uh, Fabio Gramazio said the other day, because I, I asked both Mijin and Fabio, given the new digital protocols uh, that uh, are fundamentally challenging uh, what are our visually based and compositionally based uh, phenomena in pedagogy, uh, once you take code and uh, algorith algorithmic thinking into the equation, how do you introduce that into the pedagogy and in what way does it restructure our the framework of, what, of the nine square grid or all of the other things that we've been talking about? Um, and uh, Fabio's response uh, was, well, the reality is that we have absolutely nothing to teach. Uh, you know, the best we can do is to produce an environment where exploration and experimentation can happen and hope for the best. Uh, and, and so I, w I want to, uh, given, the, gi given the kind of uh, Hippocratic oath that I assume we all have to doing good, uh, uh, taking teaching seriously uh, and, and arguing for what is right in a kind of sequence of pedagogical processes, to what degree could, I, could you be convinced that it just doesn't matter because it has to do with the environment that you create? Oof, I've been silent, so you gave me like a big one, huh? Um, yeah, so to take on Fabio's claim that we have nothing to teach, we just produce an environment. I, I think there's still, you know, I'm teaching thesis right now at Cooper with Christina, and there's definitely feeding knowledge, and there's a selection, there's a curation, there's the construction of histories, and I think what I was attempting to show a little bit was something about the texture of the archive, the materiality of that archive that we're looking at, and through it, the various environments, and, you know, I was looking at through the figures that I think were part of the institutional fabric. And so I think there's absolutely things to be taught. I think there's absolutely a uh, selection of knowledge to be fed to students. Uh, I think creativity is a tricky thing, and I think that's the anxiety we have. I don't know how you teach that. I think attitude, I think those things that are maybe part of the design method that we try to codify in some way uh, are the ones that we have the anxiety about. But I think absolutely we don't have to have anxiety about what's research. It's it's historically based in some way, whatever line you're interested in, you're adding to it in some way. And so you, and, and then I think what makes architecture kind of interesting is as a discipline we have anxiety about what architecture is. And so we kind of go into all these different uh, threads. So to try to kind of wrap it up, I would say in terms of the environment you produce, part of it is the making of this archive was helping produce that environment in some way. The fact that students were 
given transcripts of their final review lets them know that it matters. The fact that students are given, I didn't show all this, but given correspondence in which it's stated when they have to be where, lets them know that this is an important moment and it produces that kind of institutional authority. And so I think the type of environment that maybe I'm trying to produce in my classroom is different to that. I'm trying to make some of those hierarchies much more visible to the students and let them know where their agency is, but where I also have some sort of power over them. So I am attempting to breed some sort of critical thinking in that way, to get them to understand consciously how they navigate through the institution. Just one little thought on that. I, I wonder, it, it, like, you know, I was talking about archaeology, that this going forward means going back. And I wonder, like, looking at these transcripts today, I mean, the absolutely fabulous selections, by the way. Um, but on some level, it's like, I feel like we've, you know, we've been led into some trap set by Hayduck 30 years ago. That, I mean, why is this reported? Why was this transcribed? Precisely because many years later, you and I would be here talking about this on stage. You know, it was like it was already ordained. This is going to happen. Otherwise, why is it there, right? I mean, so there's a peculiar way. I mean, when you say repeating ourselves, it's like, on the other hand, it's like, there is a kind of peculiar projection from the past into the future where in this, you know, sort of uh, conveyance of pedagogy, that there's a kind of predictability to how things will happen going forward. The future is not as strange as we would like it to be. But if I caught anything between your presentations, is that uh, with the wealth of work uh, and research that was done and has been done for decades and decades, uh, came out uh, multiple moments of absurdity, uh, narcissism, uh, ridiculousness, surrealism, uh, and, and, con and complete insanity. Uh, and yet, uh, I would I would say that you, none of you could make the actual presentations that you did with the work of another school. There is something that we can all share in about five, ten minutes as we go over to the galleries that is sublime about the intensity of the work uh, as irrelevant uh, as one or another may be to the uh, solving of big problems in the world. And they provide for the framework of, of a discourse that brings what are effectively dead artifacts out of the archives and back into the project of pedagogy. And so certainly uh, I'm also guilty of trying to light a fire under the archives uh, if only to examine uh, whether what we are doing today is right in the first place, which is highly suspect. Um, Michael and Igor. Yeah, so we're running, we're running a bit behind, so it's up to you if you want to use those last minutes as to, to wrap up the conversation or to open it up to I the would, audience. I would like to open it up with uh, two or three questions before we take that break. Cool. Um, thank you for the presentation, they're very interesting. Uh, I just wanted to uh, contribute with one consideration. Um, in relation to this uh, uh, autobiographical or narcissistic or sort of individualistic approach to architecture, and is this one. Uh, I think that uh, for me, in a, in a way, the evolution of the school is not detached from the evolution of the architecture of John Aydou by uh, maybe simply the dimension of the school. Uh, and I think that what in, in the mid-70s happened, that was pointed out very, very precisely, is the recognition, I believe, by Adok of the impossibility to have a kind of meta-narrative that justify one kind of language. And so I would say that the school, and we have to think about that, Lyotard writes a book on postmodern uh, in 79. So those are the years in which this issue was very, very important. So I, I would... Uh, suggested maybe an interesting point of, of, of vantage point in relation to this, what is defined often in a very limited way as autobiographical, is in, in reality a response to this condition 
that at the time was covered by postmodernism or neo-modernism and so on. And I think that maybe when we look at some of the research project today, and it's been pointed out, uh, going into this kind of external territory, which we don't know anything at the beginning and we don't know anything at the end, in fact, then result in a kind of default language that is either minimalist, technological, uh, uh, hyper-realistic. And, and so I think that that's maybe something to consider in relation to what we have in the archives. So the kind of cultural experiment that deals with a really difficult predicament, that is the one, how do we operate in terms of a, a absence of a meta-narrative that justify formally what we do. And also, um, it's maybe also a, a, a different point of view to look at research. Because I think that certainly these works that are autobiographical, that, that's indisputable. But there is a search for what could be a language which is necessary in terms of manifesting intentions that are not necessarily formal to begin with. I, I completely agree. I mean, uh, I. I you know, I've not, I mean, strangely enough, I've found myself defending the New York Five and Peter Eisenman more than I ever would have wanted to ever in my career to, to students who, in fact, do see this kind of, you know, self-obsessed, uh, whatever it is. But I, I, I mean, I think they're not, the problem is when one doesn't read that corpus of work from the kind of pedagogical predicament that these people found themselves in the 60s as they were trying to structure something um, going forward. And, you know, I mean, and, and <clears throat> the interesting, if, if anything, if, if there's a fault here, I would say is that, on the other hand, how, how small that world of agreement was. I mean, so, but, so that's perhaps that in fact these so-called great American institutions had a few actors sort of talking about themselves and that was the discipline. We don't have that situation today. I mean now institutions are sort of overrun by so many different kinds of uh, uh, um, criteria, uh, competing ideologies, competing research uh, objectives, um, uh, and so on and so forth. But, at the, at the, but on the other hand, I mean I, I do respect precisely what you're saying, that the, the recursion to a kind of minimalist language of reflection as a way of getting pedagogy started. I, I mean, I can see that situation, and so I, I also have a sympathy with that position. Um, because it was for, for these figures sort of the answer, you know, like, what do we do? It was the answer to what we do when we know nothing and we don't know where we're going, right? I mean, so that, I think we have to be a little bit closer to the archive and to the and more sympathetic, perhaps, to uh, you know, it's it's nice to knock down icons. I, I have no, I've done, I continue to do so, but nonetheless, I mean, moving even closer, this kind of intimacy of trying to build a pedagogical artifact, you know, that I I, I think that's how we should read these projects. So I, I want to maybe. Um bargain a few words in place of other words uh, that may have uh, synonymous qualities uh, between them. Um, I mean, I, th I also ran into this issue of uh, nothing to teach quite, quite, quite a lot, you know, uh, and less so there's nothing to teach, more so there's a hesitation of how to teach and what to teach. And the hesitation, I think, for me, uh, often comes very simply in two dials. And this is a really weird kind of like Krausian diagram that, that I, I th think about a lot these days. Uh, one is um, on the notion of knowledge, how much do you know? How much do you know a lot? Uh, on the notion of knowledge, how deeply do you know? Do you know it very, very well? Uh, but it's very difficult to do both. And I think there may, I mean, uh, back to Guido's uh, point, I think there may have been a time when the choice would be how deeply do you know? Uh, and I think the choice of how deeply do you know uh, would translate to uh, words such as uh, being focused or being myopic. Uh, and being focused or myopic uh, could lead to this endless stream of looking at oneself only. Uh, and you know, I, I wonder if this is the choice that people would have made at the time. I wasn't there, therefore I don't know. But I think the how much uh, dial is technologically available to the students today. Uh, students today have so much 
uh, and therefore, you know, do, do you need to know it very well? Maybe, maybe not. And that's the that's the hesitation I run to, especially on, on uh, with regards to research. You know, if you, if you want to generate a, a broad topic, and still within that broad topic, there's the the horizontal and vertical dials, and and that causes hesitation and anxiety for for me, for me anyway. Hi, thank you for your presentations. So, I mean, I'm, I'm listening to all these uh, thoughts and I'm thinking, I still don't know what research means in architecture. Uh, perhaps maybe like if we wanted to diagnose it, we might say that as architects, we, we're pretty good at instrumentalizing any images we find or precedents we find. Uh, whether that's good or bad is also up to conversation, but, um, but that's probably what we only do if we want to call it research. Um, of course, that's not our expertise. So, um, so I think that, that for me, that's still a question mark. I don't quite understand what that means. Uh, maybe if I wanted to try to trace to uh, trace it as a kind of symptom of two two worlds. Uh, one would be that architecture entered the university, and all of a sudden, we have to uh, produce evidence. We have to justify. We have to kind of rep reproduce a model that is perhaps more scientific, um, and the humanities have their own, but uh, so of course as a result we're in crisis, uh, and I think maybe any visual discipline, not just architecture, would be in crisis uh, within the university because they would have to kind of produce these kinds of justifications. Uh, I think the other symptom is also the jury uh, system, that we have to sit in front of a number of people that we call experts. Um, and have to kind of defend uh, our work uh, and produce arguments. And so I, I think as a result that starts to produce ambiguities. Uh, and, and maybe for me, the way to begin to navigate around that was, it would be to say, well, maybe it's about intellectual curiosity and whether we delve deeply or not, that's not necessarily our role. Um, and then the other would be uh, to disrupt realities uh, because in my mind, I think visual, any visual producers or cultural producers, uh, that would potentially be their role in any society. Uh, so it's a very kind of naive, naive outlook, but I think uh, I'm still curious what uh, research means. Uh, and that would be the way to maybe enter. <laughs> I'll, do <laughs> quick, I'll, do, I'll take on a little bit of that. And yeah, I think that's a good question. And that's basically, it's the, it, you know, architecture is a contested field. There are many different position arguments and producing discourses about convincing enough people of some sort of position. And so perhaps research is codified within those discursive networks. I think the jury um, performance, I would say, maybe that you noted is really, like, I'm curious about that because I think about it, you know, reading through these transcripts, like a lot of students are talking about angels for a while. Like every student is talking, and I'm like, why are so many students talking about angels? Like every student starts. Because uh, Hayduck was giving them Cain and Abel to read. Yeah, well, thanks for killing my punchlines. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe turn that off. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, and so obviously the students are aware of their context, or obviously that context, that environment has been produced. And so it's, not, it's no coincidence that it's literally students start with, when I started to do my thesis at the, this year, I went and started reading the Bible for the first time. Like, where did that come from? So in relation, the media that surrounds them, that environment, helps define it. So the jury process now, the media that surrounds them is a digital one, and students understand that part of the performance is producing social media friendly images. And so that, so that performance that somehow codifies research, let's call it, is something that I think uh, absolutely relates to the cultural environment and the media environment that surrounds it. And so I think trying to get at that might tell you why a lot of projects uh, seamlessly circulate now through social media in some way, and that why, you know, that is the research that maybe we're codifying somewhere. I don't know. You can go. You should say something good. Uh, I'm going to ask Michael Young to direct us uh, about how we're going to restructure the uh, the entire afternoon after Arundam gets the last word. Apparently, yeah, I was hoping to hear your thoughts, Arundam. 
well, this is completely, uh, uh, I, 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 you know, I, I, I'm sort of against the idea of marrying an architect, and so I didn't. Um, but I married somebody who went to Harvard, and these are, and she had three roommates, and you know, and these are four very brilliant people. And one of them became a lawyer. Uh, my partner is a historian, and one of them became an architect whose name was Jennifer Lee. <laughs> so. <laughs> He made us, you just dissed my sister-in-law on stage. So, so let's take it outside, you know. I don't know her. Sorry. Is that it? <laughs> All in good humor. Uh, Michael, please help us uh, reframe the schedule, if you will, and, uh, and, and we can continue the discussion outside. Take it outside. <laughs> yeah, let's take this outside. Um, so yes, uh, since uh, session three started five minutes ago, it, it, it does mean that our time is uh, shifted. So Igor and I were just thinking that hopefully we can do lunch in 30 minutes and uh, reconvene back here uh, for the third session, which, which is um, no presentations in the third session. The third session is purely uh, a discussion amongst the participants and then hopefully also discussion with the audience as an attempt to try to gather our thoughts for the for the day. Does that does that make sense with everybody? Where, where would you place the gallery uh, visit uh, afterwards? The gallery visit can happen so what two twenty? Two so two twenty let's try to be back here and the gallery visit can happen uh, uh, either very rapidly now or right after we have uh, our third discussion. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody.